So they hired me and, and, and paid me to work with Brando. And I play the Stars and Stripes reporter who chases Brando around Tokyo in the picture. I was scared to death, and every scene I have is with Brando. And every time he'd look at me, the blood just drained from me. I couldn't remember my lines. I didn't know my name. And I had a lot of trouble. And I thought, you know, as we were doing these scenes, I thought, I don't want to do this anymore. Welcome back, and our next guest is William Wellman, Jr. He is a producer, writer, actor, writer of books, as well as <clears throat> other projects, and we're delighted to have you with us. It's nice to be here, Cheryl. Yeah, I know that you've been up to Lone Pine a bunch of times before, and we always enjoy that. Now, I grew up as the daughter of actors. You grew up as not only the son of one of the most famous directors ever, but as a junior. How was that for you? Well, um, it's the only way I know it. I mean, my father, I, I was, in a sense, I was directed all my life, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and my father was, uh, he was a taskmaster. He, he was, he was tough, but he was fair. Um, when I started working as an actor and the first two pictures I did were, well, the first picture and the third picture were pictures my father directed. And a lot of actors were a little nervous around my father because he was such a strong personality mm -hmm. and he had very, you know, definite ways that he wanted things done and, um, the, some of the other actors remarked to me that they felt sorry for me because he was being, he, they thought he was being tough on me, but it meant nothing to me because I'd, he'd been that way all my life. Oh. So I had no problem when he, when he said, now listen, Bill, I want you to make sure you know your lines, you're on time, I mean, there's no messing around here, you know? And I said, fine, it was no problem for me where the other actors were kind of nervous about that sort of uh, sure. approach, you know? Now, you're from a, a large family, too. Uh, what, seven? I have six siblings. Wow. I have four sisters and two brothers. Um, we now have 23, there's 23 grandchildren and 12 great-grandchildren. So uh, it still goes on. Did many of them go into the business like you did? or? Actually, I was the last of the, even though I'm the second oldest, I was the last of the seven children to, to be in films. Everybody had okay. some involvement uh, before I. Um, my brother Mike was the little kid in the High and the Mighty that slept through, you know, sure. the, the whole Jeopardy, uh, Flight of Jeopardy. Uh, my brother Tim worked in two films. He was in a film called The Happy Years that was made in, in 1951, I believe. Uh, he also worked in Track of the Cat with Robert Mitchum. Oh, yeah. Not as an actor, he, he was the track. Because he was so light, they put the shoes on him, <laughs> so he made tracks that they, they could photograph and say, this is the, this is the cat, you know, the cougar. Um, my sister Pat, actually she was cut out of a film called Island in the Sky, and she went to work uh, as Hedda Hopper's assistant. So oh, that must have been interesting. both my brothers were in the High and the Mighty, I, I, in the Island in the Sky. They played Andy Devine's kids in the movie. Um, my sister Kitty was a professional dancer. She was dancing on in the tour, uh, the touring company of uh, King and I, when she got yes. married and decided to give it up. And later, she started a dance studio. My sister Sissy has worked in the business. Uh, she's done a few films, and she was a continuing character on the Waltons. Um, 
Let's see, who did I miss? I think that's. I think that's. I think all I did. Siblings. I think I did it. Yeah. yeah. Now, how now I'm the one that went on with my father on all the sets and locations. Yeah. Now, was it because you were going on to university and all that you were a little bit later with doing? Because you went to Duke. Yes, I did. I was taking business administration, and after uh, th the end of my freshman year, I was going to UCLA. I was trying to get rid of some of the. Uh, foreign language requirements and things that they had uh, in those days for business. And um, I got a call at the end of the summer from my father uh, who was preparing this film at Warner Brothers. And he says, Bill, uh, the head of publicity and the head of casting here, they got this idea that maybe you should come and test to play the role, to play the role of me in this film, because my father was a character in the film. It was about his days as a fighter pilot in the First World War. So uh, I didn't say anything. My father says, well, you don't sound very enthusiastic. And I said, well, yeah, I'll do it, yeah. you know. So I went out there, and I was just thinking not too long ago. I mean, I've been in the business 53 years. I've probably been on thousands of interviews and auditions. When you consider I've had more than 500 jobs counting everything, print modeling, commercials, movies, television, stage, the whole thing, way over 500. So you figure, I used to figure that it, I had to go on seven auditions to get one job. I used to keep track of all the stuff and then I was making myself crazy so I had to stop doing it. But anyway, <laughs> thousands of auditions and that first one was the most difficult because I had to go out, I, I knew nothing about acting, and I had to audition in front of Jack Warner and the, his executives, my father, the head of casting, the head of publicity at Warner Brothers Studio. Uh, and they had it set up similar to this room where all the prospective actors were sitting there in this one room. Mm -hmm. And then there was the big uh, desk and behind the desk was Jack Warner and everyone, including my father. And two at a time we would come up and do a scene in front of them and in front of all the other actors. And I had to do a scene with Tab Hunter who was being considered for uh, the lead in the film. So uh, I had to go up and I had to do that. And I think the thing that saved me was that my nervousness didn't show, but I had volcanic eruptions going on inside me. Yeah. Tab Hunter is the kind of person where his nervousness showed. So I think he made me look better, <laughs> you know, and... Uh, Every little bit helps. So I, I, I got the role, and I think about the second day on location, I told my father, I said, Dad, this is what I want to do, you know. And wow. I think one of the things about my father who was, he was not the perfect father, but he was a great father. I can't imagine having a better father. And he said, well, that's great, Bill. And um, he supported me completely in that endeavor. My mother wanted me to go back and finish college. And my father would never go against my mother. Yeah. In this case, he did. He says, look, Bill wants to be an actor. He can't learn to be an actor in college. And in the 50s, there were no film schools. Yeah. You couldn't. There was nothing to, nothing to learn about the film industry. And it wasn't until many years later when my father was writing his memoirs that he wrote you know, if I can remember the quote, something about, I can't believe my son became an actor. <laughs> I mean, he didn't, he never liked it, but he wouldn't talk me out, try to talk me out of it. He realized that I wanted to do it, and he supported me 100%. Well, I love yeah. the book that you wrote about Thank your you. dad. I mean, that's such a tribute, and obviously, you adored him. I mean... <laughs> I, I did. I did. Uh, I did think he was fabulous, and I um, and I felt that he never got the recognition that he deserved. Now he got recognition for certain pictures, and just about everybody can t name four or five pictures of his that they think are absolutely fabulous. But his body of work is so amazing. And after he retired, which was his last film was released in 1958, and by 1962 I felt like he was being forgotten. And in the 60s and 70s, they didn't have all these uh, life achievement awards and film festivals and, you know, tributes to, to directors. They didn't do that. 
Uh, he never had a film retrospective of his work in the United States until I produced one wow. in 1973. Um, and I just, so it always bothered me, so I've always tried to kind of shine a light on his career. And uh, of course the book has helped a lot, and now I have, a, I have a new book I'm writing about his life because the first book really is his early life up to The Making of Wings. Uh, the winner of the first Academy Award for Best Picture. And that's because every publisher rejected my idea of a complete biography. So when the first book comes out, I get a call from Random House. They rejected me not once but twice. And they congratulated me on the book and they said, we would like you to write a complete birth to death biography of your father. Oh, that's great. And that's what I'm doing now. That's great. You told me last night about this latest interview you went on, and I just, I, I love the things actors have to go through to get a part. Um, CSI, the Vegas, the yeah. Vegas show, I, I did one, and um, they actually called, um, the production company called my agent because there was an actor uh, that they had used before that they knew and they wanted him to play this particular role. of It's a kind of a Hugh Hefner character who gets killed in the show. And because of the fact that he's alive at the beginning and then he gets murdered in a restaurant and then he's, they do an autopsy on him because they can't figure out what killed him. Mm -hmm. So they have to take his brain out, cut off the top of his head, take his brain out and figure it out. So uh, they called my agent and they want this actor, but they, they told him, you have to shave your head, you know, completely, the whole top of your head, just, you'll just have a little hair on the side. Because the camera's gonna be so close, we can't put a skull cap or something in, so we have to do that. And the actor said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> so he refused the role. So my agent didn't want to lose the, uh, the job, so she said, well, I've got Bill Wellman here and he's, just right for this part and blah 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 so I go in on this audition and and uh, it's kind of funny because they 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 said to me uh, do you really want to shave off your hair let us shave off your hair and, and in fact the the uh, director said your beautiful hair well I don't have a whole lot of hair <laughs> but I looked around the room well everyone was bald in the room so I was kind of stifling, you know, laughing at this, but I said to them, I said, look, in my 53 years, I've been shot between the eyes twice. I've had my throat cut twice. I've worn a prosthetic in a film to make me real heavy. I've had black eyes. Uh, I've been shot in the, in, the, in the nose. I've been beat up. I've had everything done except shaving my head. So it's perfect, now I'll have everything. So, you know, I'm happy to have it done. So they laughed and they gave me the job. The glamor of being yeah. an actor. <laughs> well, it was, you know, it was tricky because I've been, I've been killed and shot in a lot of films. And I've been dead in a lot of films. But I never had to be dead so long as in this CSI. Because when I'm first murdered in the restaurant and I'm lying on the floor, and in comes the CSI team. And there's like five of them, they're all talking. And I'm just lying there with my eyes open, you know. And it was midnight when we were shooting that part of the scene and my eyes were tired from the day. And I'm trying to keep my eyes open so I'm not blinking, sure. you know. And I thought, and I didn't want to ruin the take because I'm not saying anything, I'm dead. But they're all talking. And I don't want to have cut, well, the dead man is, I can see his eyes blink. You know, I didn't want any of that going on, so I, I'm trying to keep my eyes open. And I feel my eyes, oh my God. Then, now they go and do the autopsy business. So now I'm a corpse. At least I had my eyes closed. But there was so much dialogue, and they have to have the, the implements that go in and cut the, you know, cut the, you know, the fake that they're cutting off the top of my head and all this kind of stuff. And I'm lying there on this, this, this uh, metal slab, and it was cold. And I, 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 all I got is like a little G-string on. I put a little, like a little um, sheet over me. 
Yeah. And I'm freezing. And I, I don't know, I'm i starting to go like this, you know. Well, the corpse can't do that, you know. So I, so I said, well, you guys got to give me a blanket under here or something, you know. I mean, it's just, well, we don't do that. A corpse doesn't have a blanket. I said, well, I don't know how, you, how we're going to do this then. So, I mean, I, it was tough being dead. It was very tough. One of your most <laughs> yeah. difficult roles. I love it. Uh, do you have any questions out there? Uh, yes, ma'am. What was your favorite TV Western to play in? Television Western. Well, let's see. I did 16 episodes of Television Westerns. I did Have Gun, Gunsmoke, Laramie, Rawhide, Pony Express, The Gunfighter, and I did four. I did four Rawhides, four Have Guns, three Gunsmokes. Um, my favorite one. Well, I'll, let me tell you the story. Um, as an actor in the late 50s and 60s, if you were going to be a working actor, you did television westerns. Sure. They were all over the air. So I went and bought myself a whole outfit. I had the black hat, you know, and I had a black outfit, a six gun. I even bought a six gun. And I had pictures taken of this, and my agent sent them in to the various casting people. And my first audition is for Have Gun, Will Travel. And this is also my favorite segment. So I go in dressed in black, just in that outfit, and my pictures are just the same. And I walk in there, and there's Paladin. Now, it's unusual for a star to be at a casting session, but Richard Boone was so hands-on. He wanted everything to be right about that show. He worked so hard on that show, from the stories to the acting, everything. So I walk in there, and he's, got, he's looking at my picture, and he's looking at me, and he says, hey, kid, nobody dresses in black on this show except me. And I thought, oh, God, I really blew this, you know? So I called my agent after the, uh, after the interview, and I said, well, I blew that. Paladin was mad at me because I was dressed in black, you know? So he calls me the next day, says, you got the job. So, of course, I'm dressed in, like, browns. So, I mean, it's a black and white show, but he's the only one in black. So I do the show, and I did, and they liked what I did, and I, they would have me back each season, because you could only do one, one character, you know, a season. And I did four seasons, and every time I came back on the show, he'd come over to me and he'd say, Hey, kid, you still got that black outfit? <laughs> <laughs> Who, as... Being an actor, who was another actor or, or someone that really helped you develop your craft? And did you have a mentor other than your dad? Marlon Brando was my favorite. Now, I started acting in 1956, and Brando, you know, he had done all those On the Waterfront and Viva Zapata and The Wild One and The Men and all those films, and he was the number one actor in, in Hollywood at that time. And he was my favorite. And I used to try to emulate him. See, I, you have to understand, I knew nothing about acting when I got into this. And my father didn't really give acting lessons. So I was going to the Warner Brothers Talent School, and you know I was doing everything I could to try to learn, learn about this. So I thought, well, I'll pretend to be Marlon Brando. Well, next thing you know, <clears throat> the casting director at Warner's comes up to me. I had just done a, a co-starring role, and he says, Bill, do you want to work with Marlon Brando and Sayonara? I'm reaching for my wallet to pay him to put me, you know, to let me do it. I mean, you know, and so they hired me and, and, and paid me to work with Brando. And I play the Stars and Stripes reporter who chases Brando around Tokyo in the picture. I was scared to death. And every scene I have is with Brando. And every time he'd look at me, the blood just drained from me. I couldn't remember my lines. I didn't know my name. And I had a lot of trouble. And I thought, you know, as we were doing these scenes, I thought, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I mean, I, I was even, when I'm off stage, they're doing Brando's close-up. And I'm just off stage. And I've got dialogue. And he would just he would just go like this, and he'd look up, look at me, and I'd go up. 
So he's, he's going, he's nodding like he's, like he's listening to me, and I'm not saying anything. And the director says, cut. And Brando says, what the hell did you cut the camera for? And the director says, well, the kid's not saying anything. And he says, don't cut the camera. I know what he's going to say. And Brando made it so rough. And, and I was never introduced to him. No one ever said, uh, Marlon, I want you to meet Bill Wellman. You know, I was just thrown into it. And every time I did a scene, and then Brando would go off. And, you know, I never met him until the show was over. And I worked about two weeks on the show. And the last day, I was wrung out from this. I was just so nervous. And I'm leaving the set. And I walked by a dressing room. And I looked over. And it, it was Brando's dressing room. And he was sitting in there with the door open. He says, hey, kid, come in here. So this was the time I first met Marlon Brando. I go in there. And he says, sit down. He says, you know, you'll do OK. You know, just, just hang in there. Don't worry about it. You know, it was nice working with you. Puts his hand out. Wow. I shook his hand. I walked out and said, OK, I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, anybody else with a question? Yes, sir. How far along are you on your book about your father? Uh, I'm in chapter 13, and I have, uh, I think I'm going to do 18 or 19 chapters. So I, I've actually, I had to write everything that I wrote in the first book as well, which was kind of a strange experience to rewrite myself, because I can't write it in the same way, and yet all the facts have to be there. So I have to bring in a little different perspective. And a, and a lot more detail. Uh, I actually wrote a hundred more pages from the the amount of material that's in the first book, and that was. And now I'm I'm in 1935 right now, and my father, you know, went on to 1958. So I've still got about uh, 32 films to write about. He directed 76, and he did. He was uh, uncredited on 12 films, which they used to do in the old days. If a director got sick or whatever, you know, somebody would step in, another contract director, and. Well, and wasn't he one of the very few, or maybe the only one, who worked in every genre as far as film went? Yeah, my father, he loved making movies. And he wanted to make every kind of movie. And he did. I mean, he did westerns and war films and comedies and dramas and kid pictures and gangster films. And he did everything. Uh, it's an amazing, an amazing career. And that's the kind of thing he didn't really get credit for. One of the things that, you know, if you were going to go see a John Ford film or an Alfred Hitchcock film or a Frank Capra film, you pretty much knew what you were going to see, because they made so many of the same kind of films. But you never knew. If a William Wellman film came out, you didn't know what it was. It could be anything. And in a way, that, that held him back, plus the fact that he never had a publicity agent. He didn't care about any of that. He just wanted to make pictures. That's wonderful, though. I mean, it's fabulous that you are paying the tribute and all to him now. But I, did he feel this sense of accomplishment towards the end, or was he always striving to do even more? Well, he was always striving to do more, but he also, I think he, he appreciated the fact that he made all these different films. Good. Uh, now, he, of course, when he would do interviews and, and they would say, the man who directed Wings, Public Enemy, Call of the Wild, a Star is Born, Nothing Sacred, Beau Geste, Oxbow Incident, Battleground, Story of G.I. Joe, High and the Mighty. You know, they would name all these pictures that he was, that were most well known. And then when they, when he started talking, he named all his bad pictures. <laughs> he says, I did the boob and the cat's pajamas, and he would name all the bad pictures. And he loved to do that. But he did appreciate yeah, the fact yeah. that he did. And, and in, his, in his writings, he said, there were, there were a few pictures that he was very proud of, you know. But he didn't say, you know, there was 50 pictures that he liked. But uh, 
I think he did like 50 pictures. Well, I want to thank you for being with us. I mean, it's always really great to get to talk to you and talk about your dad and about the things that you're doing. Hope to see you again next year. Doing thank this. you, Cheryl. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you.